Years ago, Matthew Duman embarked on a grotesque safari, trekking thousands of miles to 10 American institutions of higher education in search of their most fascinating architectural sculpture. At last, he returned with hundreds of images, revealing the grotesque secrets of the Grotesque 10, amazing architectural sculpture from 10 American colleges and universities. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Duman, and welcome to the Grotesque 10. Now you may be wondering why I'm dressed like this, and that's because I'm going to take you, to a, take you on a grotesque safari, to a place where you can observe the behavior of grotesques and gargoyles in their natural habitat. In other words, the American college campus. So let's get started. Many years ago, I noticed this sculpture at Yale University. It not only sparked my interest in the grotesques and gargoyles at Yale, but led me to explore other universities in search of interesting sculpture. I may be thinking, what's so interesting about this one? And what does it even mean? Well, it is a bit confusing, but I'll keep you in suspense on this until the end of the lecture, but just keep this image in your head. 10. It's a nice round number, isn't it? In this case, it refers to the number of institutions of higher education that I have visited. Many of these schools are quite well known, but I did not choose them for their reputation or academic prowess. I chose them because each has a collection of artwork on their campus that I find very interesting. Now, I'm not talking about items in their museums or archives, but actual sculpture on the academic buildings themselves. Each is examples of a building style called collegiate Gothic architecture, a characteristic style, which is a revival of the Gothic architectural style of medieval Europe. It was actually constructed in America in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like their medieval cousins, many of these buildings are decorated with fascinating sculpture, which are referred to architecturally as grotesques. Therefore, my book is called The Grotesque 10. It features amazing architectural sculpture from 10 American colleges and universities. The sculpture can be particularly interesting because while it is meant to look ancient, it can possess modern concepts and themes. And what schools make up the Grotesque 10? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are a variety. Some were found in the 18th century. I mean, some were found in the 19th century and even a few from the 18th, but all possess some form of architectural sculpture on their campus buildings. The 10 schools featured in my book are Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, Duke University in North Carolina, Northwestern University in Illinois, Princeton University in New Jersey, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, the City College of New York in New York City, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, the University of Chicago in Illinois, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and because I keep finding new sculpture there, even after years of exploring, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Gothic architecture came out of medieval Europe. Even back then, it was not new to decorate buildings with sculptural flourishes. But in medieval times, it was common to apply sculpture to churches to scare away evil spirits, or on a more practical level, to graphically demonstrate lessons of morality from the church, because much of the parish population was of the time was illiterate. Universities that at this time were closely associated with the church. Often academic life was centered around a cathedral. So the architecture of the church greatly influenced that of university buildings. And this carried through to modern times. You see the shape of the windows in this photo and the use of spires and roughly cut stone in the walls in this building at Duke University. Now, when we look at these buildings, are we, are we to, to believe that multiple groups of architects, masons, and glaziers came to North America during the medieval period and set about constructing Gothic building projects in far-flung places on a wild, unexplored continent? 
Well, if you believe this, then contact me after the lecture because I've got some lucrative investment opportunities for you. So in other words, no, of course not. E examples like this are obviously much younger than those in medieval Europe. The collegiate Gothic trend became popular in the mid 19th century and remained so through the 1930s and is also still in use today. Rockefeller Hall was built at Bryn Mawr in 1904. Bass Tower was, was constructed at Yale in 2017. So why do college architects look backward for inspiration when designing campus buildings? Well, not surprisingly, a big reason was financial. Even the oldest colleges in North America are new compared to the old world institutions of Europe. American colleges also lack the cultural status that the, those of Europe had. And 150 years ago, our universities were not looked upon with the nostalgia and respect that they are today. Reviving the venerable building traditions like Gothic was a great way to create an unspoken connection with the long established universities of Europe. This connection elevates the status and prestige of American universities and in turn their endowments and donations as well. Now there are, are a variety of historic styles. Many of these and other campuses have buildings that were built in other architectural styles, such as the Georgian style from 18th century England or the classical style from ancient Greece. Honestly, most campuses have become a mixture of many different styles. So why choose to revive Gothic for your college campus? Well, by the mid 19th century, the industrial, industrial revolution was in full swing. While there are many positive advancements to the industrialization, many came to see mass production as a threat to individuality and individual craftsmanship. Gothic was seen to celebrate the individual and individual expression. Think of the distinction between something that's handmade versus something that's mass produced. And also in a practical sense, Gothic encourages asymmetry, like this building at Duke. This plan better fit the variety of uses that collegiate buildings have to accommodate, such as athletic facilities, lecture halls, laboratories, libraries, dormitories, etc. Different, fu different functions require different types of space. And most importantly, Gothic architecture is seen as timeless. Generally, Gothic style buildings look old, no matter what the actual age of the building is. I know it's cliche, but it can be said that universities are like a fine wine. Wines improve with age and schools are seen in the same fashion. This concept was not lost on architects. While you can't change the actual age of a building, you can change the perceived age of it or how old it looks to be. In fact, these architects use many subtle and some would say sneaky techniques to enhance the age of their buildings. At Duke University, you can find some staircases which are worn from so many years of footsteps that, that the tread of the steps is grooved. These stairs have actually been molded with the groove in them from the beginning. These steps are meant to show the wear of many hundreds of years of footsteps on a staircase that in actuality is not yet 100 years old. These were built in 1938. Another technique involves the roofs of these buildings. Most collegiate Gothic structures have slate rock shingling in their roofs. Look closely and you'll see many imperfections in the shingles, chips, cracks in the slate, and rough uneven surfaces, speaking of hundreds of years of exposure to the elements. As in the case of the stairs, many of these grooves were intentionally created this way, with chips and discolorations purposefully added. Other aging techniques involve the building of the walls themselves. Random window frames look, look, may have no glass and look to have been blocked up years after construction. These, these features are intended to give the building the look of sporadic renovations over hundreds of years, when in fact the building many times was built, was built with, these, with these features already blocked up from the beginning. And look at this blocked up window at the City College of New York. You see, you see the iron bars to enhance the illusion that this was once a real window? But think about it. Why would they leave the iron bars there after sealing the window? What practical purpose do they serve now? What criminal would try to, try to break into a window that is now as solid as the wall around it? One decorative feature commonly seen in these buildings is the architectural niche. 
They were a tall, thin alcove, usually featuring a decorative canopy at the top and a flat platform at the base. It looked like the perfect place for a statue, and some do contain just that. But more often than not, they are empty. These were intentionally left empty. You're supposed to assume that, these, that all these spaces were originally filled with dignified sculpture, but throughout the building's quote unquote long and colorful history, most of these statues were stolen, destroyed, or just plain removed, when in actuality, most are empty from the beginning. And lastly, never underestimate the aging effect of a good garnish of ivy. Mendel Hall at the University of Chicago dates from the late 19th century, but looks positively ancient when encased in ivy. These aging techniques are, techniques are meant to work on passers-by at an almost subliminal level, unconsciously lead, leading you to draw the conclusion that these buildings are pretty darn old. You don't know how old, but definitely much older than any man-made structure nearby. This brings us to my favorite feature of Gothic buildings, grotesques. Putting sculpted decoration on collegiate Gothic buildings is a direct extension of the Gothic traditions of European architecture. Many early collegiate Gothic buildings have grotesques featuring medieval imagery, such as this king from the University of Chicago. Another way to strengthen the connection between the institutions of the new and the old world. In architectural terms, a grotesque is a sculpted decoration on or in a building, and usually is representative of a human, animal, or fanciful creature, usually and whose form is exaggerated to the point of caricature. A gargoyle is one type of grotesque. This is a specific kind which is used to channel rainwater off of the roof and away from the building so as to protect the masonry from erosion. So basically, it's a decorative rain spout, hence the modern verb to gargoyle. I've already demonstrated how these buildings can mislead you and the world of grotesques is no exception. This sculpture from the University of Chicago looks like a gargoyle, but look closely. It does not have a pipe or a channel to drain water. I call these false gar gargoyles. While they are intended to look like gargoyles, they are just regular grotesques. And to make it easier to understand, I've divided grotesques into categories based on their subject matter. When I began establishing categories for grotesques, I originally referred to them as different species to show that, like animals, grotesques can come in a wide variety of types, until I found there was a fatal flaw in this analogy. By definition, two animals of different species cannot produce offspring, no matter what the sci-fi channel may tell you. So, I'm sorry to say, you'll never see a sharktopus or a whale wolf. By the way, this image is not in my book. But different breeds of animal reproduce all the time, like mixed breed dogs or cats. I find these types of grotesques to be a fascinating mix of meanings. Often you need to look at them many times in order inter to interpret the many messages contained within, because they may combine the characteristics of multiple breeds. A basic breed of grotesque is the historic variety. They usually portray something about the history of their building, its area of study, the school, town, state, or even country. At the back of Yale's Sterling Memorial Library, two reliefs depict similar occurrences, but set 212 years apart. Yale was founded in 1701 in Brantford, Connecticut. The school built a college house in New Haven in 1718. One relief depicts the transport of Yale's books via ox cart to the new building in New Haven. The other portrays the unloading of books from other Yale libraries from a gasoline-powered truck to the newly built Sterling Memorial Library in 1930. Demonstrative grotesques simply depict some aspect of the purpose of their building. Howe's Chapel is part of the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary on the campus of Northwestern in Illinois. The finial on its roof depicts two hands clasped together in prayer, a preview of the, of the activity commonly found inside the chapel. The demonstrative grotesque seems a pretty straightforward concept, but things can get confusing as time moves on and buildings change their function. Rosenwald Hall at the University of Chicago serves as the admissions building, but began life as home to the Department of Geology. This explains the, this relief portraying a saddlebag, rock hammers, bosses of sea life, and the slogan, dig and discover. 
Collegiate Gothic buildings can also have the type of grotesque, the breed of grotesque that convey their meaning through allegory and symbols, as in the front of Northwestern University's Deering Library, where allegorical grotesques teach time-honored lessons, like a winged hourglass for time flies, or a tortoise that crawls slowly past a sleeping hare, recalling Aesop's fable and proclaiming, haste makes waste. An important breed of grotesque is those of the school spirit variety. They usually consist of a representation of the school's mascot or some other symbol relating to the institution's identity. Trinity's mascot is the Bantam, a particularly stubborn and scrappy rooster. Its likenesses can be found flanking the archway at the Downs Memorial, Memorial Clock Tower. This gentleman is not the City College of New York's mascot, but he is displaying the school seal. And Handsome Dan the Bulldog is Yale's mascot. He can be found many places around Yale's campus, like here at Polly Murray Residence College, and him looking out of his doghouse. And judging by the shape, by the state of his bowl, I think he, I think he wants to be fed. One of my favorite breeds is the facetious grotesque, or the funny ones. Now, when writing this book, I intentionally left this breed for last, assuming that it would be the easiest one to write about, because I find it the most enjoyable. However, when it, when it finally came, became time to write this section, I quickly realized the huge distinction between telling a joke and explaining a joke. In my first attempt, I was trying to explain these grotesques, dissecting their message, and at the same time, stripping out all the humor. Therefore, I let this breed of grotesque speak of themselves. Such, such, oh, such as this, Less Than Literate Demon on Princeton University's Dillon Gymnasium. Or this drunken patriot on the University of Pennsylvania's residence quadrangle. You know, now, now that I look at, look at it, this might have some of the, um, the historical breed of grotesque in it, if this is supposed to represent a drunken Ben Franklin. Another personal favorite of mine are those grotesques that are just plain bizarre. The facetious grotesques are attractive because they make us laugh and feel good. But what makes these bizarre grotesques so attractive? Well, here's my theory. From childhood, we are taught to believe that every question has an answer and every puzzle a solution. When we come upon puzzles such as these grotesques, they become inherently interesting to us because we get preoccupied with finding their meaning, even when there may be no meaning to find, such as just baby ape in short pants on Washington University's Macmillan Hall. I just don't know what to say about this one at the University of Pennsylvania's residence quadrangle. Now the spikes are there, that's just, that was, they were put there later, so that's just so birds don't land on the cornice, but I don't know what they were thinking when they sculpted this one. The final breed of grotesque is one that by its very nature gets little attention, and that's the reclusive breed. It's a type of architectural Easter egg and literally sneaks by most people. They could be as simple as abstract animals hiding in the decoration, like these abstracted tiger's heads, the tiger's Princeton's mascot, hiding in the decor of Jones Hall. Or at Trinity, where you can find a rabbit and a monk carved literally underfoot into the flagstones of the cloisters at the chapel. Now that you know the general types of grotesques, let's have a look at a few from each school of the Grotesque 10. Penn's expansive residence quadrangle is known by some as the quad tannic. Now, my first guess on this, I said, oh, it's, that's, that's easy because it's a huge, sprawling, ornately decorated residential complex. It takes up almost three city blocks, and the west end of the, the quad comes to a point like the prow of a ship. Well, I found out, no, that's, that's not why. It was really given the nickname the quad tannic by its maintenance staff because the basement always floods when it rains. One of my personal favorites at Penn is this guy at the quad. He's also on the cover of my book. The, this head is over four feet tall and mounted on the wall of a tunnel. These metal bars on either side meet to hold the lantern directly in front of the sculpture. Now I would imagine that encountering the sculpture under harsh light late at night would be pretty unsettling. I'll also note the, the wacky faces on either side. On another building, the Evans Museum and Dental Institute, there are many grotesques on its walls, and some are a reminder of a time before painless dentistry. 
These statues are part of a series of four on the Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They were sculpted by Alexander Calder, not the artist who made the abstract mobiles out of pieces of metal, but rather his father, Alexander Sterling Calder, who had a more realistic style. This series of four represents the, the, the four corners of the earth from which the museum draws its artifacts. And pictured here on the left is Africa and on the right is North America. Many grotesques line the entrance arches at Deering Library in Northwestern. Some are allegorical grotesques, illustrating Aesop's fables. Oh, and also, the en also note the empty niches between the arches. One fable represented is called the old and the young rat. According to this fable, a cunning old rat, shown at the left, finds a trap baited with delicious cheese. He kindly offers it to a naive young rat who springs the trap while trying to retrieve the cheese. This leaves the cheese available for the old rat to enjoy. And the moral of this is listed as, the, as do not blindly accept gifts. Oh, and also note the books under the trap, suggesting this, this, this fable is set in Deering Library itself. Another fa fable depicted is called The Old Woman in the Jug. An elderly woman who really loves wine finds a wine jug by the side of the road. To her disappointment, it's empty, but it still has the delightful fragrance of wine that it once held. And while the moral of this, is, this fable is listed as the memory of a good deed lives on, I think a person who is sniffing empty containers she finds on the side of the road has deeper issues. These grotesques do not represent fables. Deering Library was designed as a place for serious study portrayed at the left. But a browsing room was included so students could read for amusement as well, suggested by the jester's outfit on the right. Duke University's West Campus is a beautiful example of collegiate Gothic architecture. The Philadelphia architecture firm of Horace Trumbauer designed this section of campus during the 1930s. The firm's lead designer, Julian Abiel, who actually designed most of these buildings, was African-American. He worked from Philadelphia and never traveled to Duke, Duke's campus to see his creations because he was opposed to the Jim Crow laws that were still in effect in North Carolina at the time. The cigarette butt in this laughing grotesque mouth is not part of the sculpture, but that is how I found it. And because the Duke family built much of its fortune from the tobacco trade, I thought it was appropriate. On the rear of Duke's original medical school building, you can find this horrified student. I like to think this is a first year medical student observing his first cadaver dissection. A vestibule in the residence quadrangles has a series of allegorical grotesques that convey an overall message. You have hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, and think no evil. Taken individually, they are merely classical heads sporting vague hand gestures. But these enhance the meaning of one another by being located so close and together imply a theme, the four ways to avoid the many temptations inherent in college life. East Pine Hall, constructed in 1897, was one of Princeton's first collegiate Gothic buildings. To show how serious the school was about the style of their buildings, Princeton's campus planners had to threaten to fire the architect, William Potter, when he wanted to build it in a different style. 1879 Hall has lots of mischievous monkeys. These are not demonstrative grotesques, as there are never any actual monkeys here. These are allegorical grotesques, depicting students as under-evolved primates, annoying a professor who is portrayed as human. This shows that Princeton professors have themselves evolved from rambunctious students. Princeton's Graduate College has these joyriding sweethearts roaring down the road in the newfangled motor car. A goose and a pig leaped to get out of the way of their tires. They were called the modern youth in a New York Times article from 1927 because both were smoking. Now the cigarettes have long since broken off, but the New York, the headline of the article, New York Times article remains. And that, that of girl gargoyle smokes. 
And about how about these ghoulish grotesques? The decapitation on the right and the tongue, tongue twister on the left live up on Jolene Dorn, live up to what you expect of the word grotesque. The Simmons shows Brookings Hall Tower from the cloisters at Ridgely Hall. Brookings Hall is the school's administration building, but has some surprisingly bizarre grotesques, like this one that's called the, the dragon and his unfortunate victim. This grotesque is located over the entrance to the Ann Olin Women's Building and is of the school spirit breed. You can see the school's motto, which translates from Latin to strength through truth. But if you stand right outside the entrance, right below it, and look up, so you're seeing the underside of it, you can see it, it hides, a, hides a reclusive grotesque, a beskirted yet mustachioed monster. Like many European Gothic cathedrals, Washington University's Graham Chapel has religious carvings on the inside, but these are balanced by many bizarre grotesques depicting the alternative to heaven on the outside. This image shows Northam Towers, part of a series of buildings at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. And they're called the long, they're collectively called the Long Walk, as, and this picture shows them from the chapel cloisters. The Long Walk buildings were the first buildings to be constructed on the site in 1878 and only a small part of the original plan. One of these, Seabury Hall, has this two-headed grotesque by its entrance. It portrays male and female graduates commemorating 25 years of co-education at Trinity, the school beginning admitted women in 1969. So this grotesque actually dates from 1994. Some Trinity buildings were built with blank spots for later carving. You can see other blanks on the towers of the chapel. Sadly, the Great Depression caught up with Trinity as it was completing construction on the chapel. There was not enough money to complete the entire plan, so some grotesque ornament was scrapped in favor of more other, more practical aspects of the design. However, inside the chapel is a different story. There are many sculpted pew ends inside, and he, all the elements of, of these carvings are important in conveying their identity. This might have looked like the small figure of a woodsman, but thanks to the sense of scale provided by the trees surrounding them, he is quickly identified as the enormous figure of Paul Bunyan. Another commemorates the chapel's primary donor, William Mather, whose ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Portrays a group of William's forebearers kneeling in prayer, thanking God for their safe journey to the new world. And you can see the Mayflower at anchor in the background. But what's those two figures in the middle ground? I'll, I'll zoom in. A settler, armed with a rifle, chases a Native American. This is based on a pun that William once told, in which he joked that his ancestors were of the sword who, immediately after coming ashore, they fell upon their knees in prayer. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. Mather lived in less than PC time. The University of Chicago's first campus architect, Henry Ives Cobb, gifted this gate to the school. He always had limitations imposed on him by the university trustees when designing campus buildings. However, since he used his own money for this gate, he was generous with the grotesque ornament by depicting these creatures ascending the roof. <clears throat> Now there is an interpretation as to what these mean, but I, I really think it was made up after the fact. But according to this interpretation, when you first come to the University of Chicago, first you have to get by the admissions officer, shown at the lower left, and then as you ascend the, the ranks and ascend the roof here, you're, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, and then at the top, a senior. Originally home to the Department of Geology, Rosenwald Hall has two representations of the moon, each with a human character representing its age. One version on the right, the moon is shown with a child. Like, like the child, the moon is young and therefore has a smooth surface. This is contrasted by an older moon on the left, which is shown with an elderly man. His moon is older, so it has a heavy accumulation of craters. The International Building provides housing for international students. One relief depicts the flow of people from different cultures from the old world to the new via steamship. 
And to the left of this arch is a primitive man holding a club. And to the right, a, a modern educated scholar holding a book. The City College of New York was founded as a social experiment in 1847. The school was totally funded by taxpayers, so tuition was free and admission was based solely on academic merit. For this reason, the school was originally nicknamed the Harvard of the Proletariat. However, based on buildings like Shepherd Hall here, the school was recently given a more modern nickname, that of Hogwarts in Manhattan. And if this is Hogwarts, this must be Dumbledore on a bad day. Elsewhere, a zoologist measures a bird skeleton and a geologist ponders crystals. At the top of one of Shepherd Hall's towers, an astronomer has caught a falling star. Note the telescope in his left hand. These original buildings were constructed in the early 1900s. Notice these grotesques were, seem in very good condition for being exposed for more than 100 years. Well, the secret is, these, these are not the original grotesques. Here are some of the originals. They consisted of terracotta covered in a thick, glossy glaze. From the beginning, no one liked the glossy finish. So, so all the grotesques were sandblasted to a matte finish. Unbeknownst to anyone at the time, the sandblasting created thousands of mini cracks in the finish, which allowed the moisture to seep in and begin to destroy the grotesques by by expanding the, the cracks through repeated freezing and thawing. By the 1970s, these grotesques were falling apart. Starting in the 1980s, all the sculpture was taken down. Durable replacements were cast and put up. The originals were put into storage, and in the early 2000s, some were dumped next to the school's architecture building. So near a parking area next to Spitzer Hall is a graveyard of some of the C City College of New York's original grotesques. Bryn Mawr is a women's college founded in 1888 and determined to be a direct competitor to men's colleges. Important among the methods to achieve this goal was the construction of a Gothic campus. Pembroke Hall is held in high esteem as one of the finest collegiate Gothic structures in the country. This relief is a reference to Pembroke College at Oxford, which was named for William Herbert, the third Earl of Pembroke. Note the shield at the center with the three lions the Herbert family crest. And at the bottom, the French phrase, which, which translates to, a uh, French phrase in Herbert family motto, which translates to, I will serve only one. The cloisters of the old library are encircled with many creatures, such as these two with leathery bat-like wings. The owl is Bryn Mawr's mascot, and many versions of it can be seen on Rockefeller Hall. Here, one owl inter interrupts another's reading. Or are these owls attending class? I guess I was interrupting an important lesson when I took this photo. Yale University is an example of a, a historic university that has developed in conjunction with the surrounding city of New Haven, Connecticut. A few years after its founding in 1701, Yale moved to New Haven. This means that from 1718 on, the school and city grew simultaneously. After 300 years, Yale's campus has become enmeshed in the fabric of New Haven. So Yale uses architectural styles like collegiate Gothic to visually separate its buildings from those of the city. This is the tower of Yale's law school. When you see it, you immediately know it's part of Yale because the only similar buildings in New Haven are other Yale buildings. And you couldn't mistake this for an office building or, or a bank. The collegiate Gothic style faded in the late 1930s in favor of more modern and abstract styles, but it didn't totally disappear. Yale completed two residence colleges in 2017, both in the collegiate Gothic style. On Ben Franklin Residence College, you can find this series of portraits. Who are they? Well, the key to answering this lies in the abstract relief at the center. Looks like a satellite photo you might see on Google Maps or, or MapQuest. Look at the building in the center. Its rounded porch may look familiar. This is an overhead view of the White House city block in Washington, D.C. The Y within the White House identifies these portraits, these as portraits of various Yale alumni who have occupied it. 
and going counterclockwise from left, the 27th president, William Taft, the 38th president, Gerald Ford, the 40, 41st president, George Bush Sr., the 42nd president, Bill Clinton, and the 43rd president, George Bush Jr. This relief decorates the outside of Polly Murray College's lounge and depicts the hamburger as it was originally intended by its creator, New Haven's Lewis Lesson of Louis' Lunch, on toast without ketchup. This pizza peel holds two slices. From the arrangement of the toppings, one can tell that they come from two famous New Haven pizzerias, that of Pepe's and Sally's. And personally, I like the, uh, the, the use of the pepperoni slices as periods. Polly Murray College alludes to the early days of computing by referencing pioneer and Yale alum, Grace Hopper. She coined the term computer bug when she found a moth that short-circuited her computer. Modern computing is portrayed by this electronic tablet. Actually, I really think it's an iPad, judging by the, uh, the shape of the home button at the bottom. These are just a few of the examples I've, of what I found at these campuses. My book has 300 pages and over 500 photos, so there are many, many more. When I traveled to these campuses, I came to see I had a certain advantage over people who lived and worked in them every day. I found I had the newcomer's advantage of having a fresh perspective by seeing these buildings for the first time. Many people who had met at these institutions were surprised by what I found at their own campus. To be honest, I believe this has more to do with my mindset than my powers of observation. It's very easy to become distracted and never notice the detail around you, especially when your surroundings have become so familiar. By its generous use of ornament, collegiate Gothic, is an example of the many opportunities to find intriguing things that can exist all around us that we may overlook every day. Things that, upon closer inspection, reveal a variety of fascinating ideas and stories. What I wanted to accomplish by, accomplish by assembling these images is to show a few of the amazing things that you can find by merely noticing the detail around you. Not just blindly accepting the way things are, but asking why things are the way they are. So look around you. You might find interesting things literally coming out of the woodwork like these old chums inside Trinity Chapel in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, remember these guys? My sarcastic nickname for this sculpture is Pilgrim's Progress. When I first saw it, Pilgrim's Progress looked a little different. Originally, it looked like this. This is on Sterling Memorial Library at Yale University. And in 2017, Yale was renovating Sterling. Now, Yale has had problems with political correctness in the past. So, fearing controversy, the university put a blob of cement over the Puritan's rifle. This caused the controversy itself. So, the whole sculpture was covered with wood. In the fall of 2019, the wood came down and Pilgrim's Progress was gone. It was replaced by this. A grotesque depicting a, a tutor and a student which is a mirror image of the, of the original one on the other side of the gate. Note the, how the book they're holding in the new version on the right is facing the wrong way. Now, all I can say about this is if Marty McFly has taught us anything, from Marty McFly from Back to the Future has taught us anything, is that you can't change the past without ruining the present. My book, The Grotesque 10, is available at thegrotesque10.com and on Amazon. And if, you, if you'd like to contact me, my email address is matthew.duman at thegrotesque10.com. That's Matthew with one T. So that's my lecture. Are there, are there any questions? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I have a quick question. Sure. So I know um, you talked a few different times. So my sister is actually studying geology and she's sitting here with me. Um, so okay. we were really here that some of the grotesques talked about, you know, showed a geologist working um, and they're very humorous. That was really cool to see. Yeah. Um, and I know you mentioned a few other ones. We saw something about astronomy and a few other ones, but were there like when you were going around and Kind of collecting all of your data and you know taking all these photos did you see other than the geology any kind of like groupings of you know that they were showing different fields were any did any stand out 
to you? The, actually, at the University of Chicago, they have a, a representation of the Pythagorean theorem on one of the mathematics buildings. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And, and let's see, there's, um, at Yale, I know on the engineering building, there's all different reliefs depicting everything from like pulleys and gears to hydroelectric electric dams, kind of like running the gamut of different types of engineering. So the, those would be like the, as I said, the demonstrative grotesques that have, some, that have a relation to what the, um, the subject matter of, of that is being taught inside the building. Okay, cool. Were there mm -hmm. any that you saw on any of like the art or architecture buildings? Um, most of the, on the schools that I went to, the, the art and architecture buildings were very modern. So they were in a totally different style. So they were more abstract. So they really didn't have this type of, this type, this to, um, this type of sculpture on them. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. Honestly. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, I guess I, it's not even as much a question as just um, a comment that I was fascinated by the fact that these university buildings were made to look older than they, than they are. Yes, I found that out. That's one of these, the perks that I didn't realize I was gonna stumble upon when <laughs> I started this. I assumed, I grew up just outside of Yale University and I grew up with those buildings and I assumed they were hundreds of years old. Oh but yeah. Those buildings were built in the 20s and the 30s. And, and a lot of at the buildings at these other schools are around the same age. Yeah. But yeah, they have all those little sneaky techniques. There is a lot of stories one story that comes to mind at Yale was the, um, the uh, uh, architect who did a lot of work at Yale called James Gamble Rogers. One of the stories has him, they, they have a bell tower called Harkness Tower, which is kind of the cent center of campus. And he, he designed it, it was built in 1921. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, bell tower. But it said that he was not and at the time, it was the tallest freestanding stone structure mm -hmm. in America in 1921. So, but he wasn't satisfied because it was too new looking. So the story goes that he, is that he had acid poured down the sides to kind of age the building. Now this, this ate away at the, at the mortar and weakened it enough that they had to put steel supports. So then it was no longer the tallest freestanding stone structure. In the <laughs> So I can't say, I don't know if that's exactly completely true, but it's a good story nonetheless. No, that's a great story. Yeah. Well, and I was wondering too with the ivy, because ivy tends to damage buildings. Yeah, it, it goes into all the cracks as well. Yes. I just wonder how many um, concrete or stone steps I've walked on thinking that they're hundreds of years old. Oh, yeah. I was completely surprised when I, when I found that out. Yeah, that's, uh, about, that's actually, that's kind of cool. But thank me, you, this is, at, this is very interesting. To, to me, I look at the, um, these campuses and I, it, it reminds me of kind of like a theme park almost, because uh -huh. everything's really designed for your experience. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a building at Yale where it's on a street and all the other buildings are collegiate Gothic buildings and this building is collegiate Gothic, but if you, walk in the front gate into the courtyard, the rest of the building is the Georgian style. So it's only the front facade that's collegiate Gothic. And that's just to, to harmonize with the other collegiate Gothic buildings uh, next door and across the street. Yeah, interesting. Fascinating, thank you. Sure. Nancy, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so the one slide showed where they ran out of money and they didn't finish any sculptures at the top. So that's what, how it starts out. It's just a big block of, of whatever and they are sculpting by hand. 
I was actually amazed. I assumed that they were, most of them, that they all were sculpted on the ground and they're just kind of hoisted into place. Right, right. But I found that a lot of them are sculpted what they call in situ, which is mean, which is mean they put a block up there and then, then sculptors go up there and, and shape it, which is amazing to me. Cause that, cause like at that building, that was in the top of the towers of the chapel at Trinity. That's pretty high, but yeah, they're, but, but a lot of them are sculpted, as I said, in situ like that. That's incredible. Are mm. there still people who do sculptures like that? Yes, not, not as many, but they're, they're, they're still around. It'd be like a lost art. Yeah, it's one of those, art, those arts that only, that it is, isn't as common as, as it once was, there, because there isn't much of a, there isn't as much need for it. Right, right. On all these, all these buildings, I said that um, Yale had just built those two new residential colleges. Well, when they came out, there was a huge, there was a lot of criticism about it. You know, why is Yale looking backwards? And, but then again, Yale had built modern buildings too, and there was criticism of them. So you really can't, you can't please everyone, yeah. basically. <laughs> Well, everything was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, for the few that are still on the call, his book will be available soon in the library. We've had it on display, but it'll be ready to be checked out soon. I have one more story about James Gamble Rogers. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a similar type of story. When he, um, the story goes, when he, it's about those, the roofs, those slate shingled roofs. It said when he uh, finished a building and before, well, it was not quite finished. The, the shingles weren't put up yet. And he, and he didn't like when the shingles were delivered. He didn't like what, how they were too new looking. So he had them buried in Long Island Sound which is this, which is this, um, this bay right, right by New Haven. He had them buried under the water for like six months or so. And then after that time, he had them dug up and they were nicely aged and pitted and cracked. And then he was satisfied with, with their aging effect and then he had them put up. <laughs> so, again, I can't say that's 100% true because this is like stories that are passed down from word of mouth, but again, it's a good story nonetheless. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm.